close it was. Don't lose that. In that house, the Bible says they're pressing in and they can't get in. That's enough. They're hanging out the windows. They're crowding this place on because Jesus' fame has reached this area. And so I want to read you two accounts. There's a lot of accounts in Scripture about Capernaum. But I want to read you two accounts. After we're done reading, we're going to pray. And we're going to notice these. They're called friezes. They're actually pieces of, of uh, architecture that have been made in the Roman era. One of them has a menorah. And uh, they moved it from time to time, so I can't tell you exactly where it is. But it's on one of these friezes, maybe right down over in there. Look for the menorah. It's a part of two stages in a box. Uh, so you have to have the menorah. It's a part of two stages. It's only the picture that you have of the box that's the part that tells the, uh, the, um, the architect. So if you want to make sure you see that. If you can't find it, I'll try to find it afterwards. We'll go down there. You can look at the church. And we'll go inside and I'll explain how that church was built up. So let me read you a little bit of scripture. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. 13 is where it starts. I'm going to start a little bit uh, after. So he comes down from Caesarea Philippi. Right after that. And it says this in 13. Um, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Nazareth is that way through the pass. He came and dwelt in, in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast. You can see that right here. In the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali. That's the two areas that we're giving them here. That were given to two of the tribes of, of Jacob. That might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. That's the Greek word for Isaiah the prophet. And by the way, that is found uh, in Isaiah. He talks to us about what uh, is Isaiah chapter 9. Let's see, here's what it says The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, Sea of Galilee, beyond the Jordan, means above the Jordan, a Galilee of the Gentiles. The people which sat in darkness, people right here, saw great light. And to them that sat in the region of the shadow of death, light is spring up. These are forgotten people. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say to them, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee, very close to here, probably from being in this city, walking down to the seashore, he sees people fishing. It says, Saw two uh, brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And you know what they said? Well, we've got to go tie up all of our fishing business. We've got to bring the nets back. We've got to bring the boats back. We've got to go tell our moms and our dads. We've got to go kind of make this what it says. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Matthew loves to use that word straightway. It's the immediacy. He also used the word immediate. They made a decision right then and there, just when Jesus came to follow him. Jesus did not give a personal invitation. To everyone. They did not know him. They were not up here with him. They knew of him. So when he asked them to follow him, it says that they left their nets immediately and they followed him. Now you know why Jesus talking about that great, great fish later on when he, res when he resurrects. Because Peter is going back to where he was first called and, and, and Jesus saying, you know, you left your nets for me immediately. And now you're having second thoughts. Sometimes in Christianity you can have second thoughts. Sometimes you can pray and you can have second thoughts. God really does. Let's be real. 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 And this is something that reminds me and tells me that the whole idea of Christianity is an immediacy. You know, we're not called to logically figure things out. We can't always logically figure things out. We're called to be able to follow without questioning. That sounds strange, especially in our society today. I don't think you should park your brain someplace. I think that's why you're getting a lot of education when you come here as, long, as well as archaeological. But there's a point of us that has to leave our logic and use our faith. And so our faith is something that says, I don't understand where I'm going. I don't know how I'm going there. I don't have any reason to believe that that I know what the end is going to be, but I'm going to trust Jesus. That's the whole idea of the follow me. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. By the way, they never became fishers of men when they followed Jesus. None of the disciples ever caught a single man who <laughs> followed Jesus. It was only afterwards, after that they saw it. So sometimes when God asks you to follow Him, it's not because you're going to see something immediately happen. It's because you're going to listen to Him, you're going to take in what He's saying through the Word, and eventually you can have fruit. Uh, the Word always gives fruit. Let me give you one more part of Capernaum, as we see it in Scriptures, and it's actually in a 
It's actually chapter 9, verse 1. It says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came to his own city. That's here. And behold, they brought unto him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. That happened right there. That's the house. That's underneath there. There is a house, a round spot. That is exactly where they brought me. So what I'm telling you, you're standing in this spot. It says, and behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. The scribes come from here. Look at the distance. That's probably less than 100 yards. So the scribes see Jesus coming. And what Jesus said, and he has to say, he should keep up. And he says, the first thing he says to him is, your sins are forgiven. The, so the Pharisees are probably ripping their clothes at this point and saying, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. He goes on and says this. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Why are you thinking evil of me? You haven't done anything yet. Only I told the man of two. And then he says, Is it? He asked them a question. For whether it is easy to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thy house. And he rose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which have given power unto men. So I'm going to read one more verse before I do that. So why is it that we can believe that Jesus, for, how many believe Jesus can forgive your sins? So why is it there's a whole bunch of Christians in America and around the world that believe Jesus can forgive your sins, but they don't believe he can heal you? How in the world can you believe that Jesus will forgive your sins but you can't believe that, you know why? Because science has told us that doctors heal us. Doctors don't heal us. Doctors administer drugs, they, they have evaluated your life, and I'm not saying they're wrong. I think that they're great. My, when my car's sick, I take it to a mechanic because he knows about cars. When my body's sick, I take it to a doctor. But he cannot heal you. Only Christ can heal you. So if you believe in your sins be forgiven, it's quite all right for you to believe that you can be healed. Because to forgive sins, Jesus said, is more difficult, you have to be the son of God, than to actually have a healer around. So he's healing so that they can understand that he has power to forgive sins. And then it goes on and says this. So you just came right over there, watch this, and that was where the gate was. And as Jesus passed forth from there, uh, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the seat of customs, and he said unto him, follow me, and he arose and followed him. So you just passed probably within five feet of where Matthew was sitting and where Jesus passed. So you're literally walking on the footsteps of what really occurred, what really hits you here is this, the inclusionism of Jesus. We live in a world today where everybody wants to accept everybody else, inclusionism. And that sounds really nice, but what Jesus did was really have inclusionism. Let me tell you how. The fisherman hated the tax collector. The tax collector wasn't real crazy about the fisherman. Why? Because the tax collector was a Jew. He collected taxes for Rome. He could collect a certain amount of tax. There was two dollars. That went to, that, a dollar of it went to Rome. One dollar went to him. He could collect anything he wanted past the work required of Rome. So they were rich, they were one of the richest people. So if you had a fishing business, he'd say, okay, today's tax is four dollars. He'd say, well, yesterday's was, was two dollars. He could set any price he wanted, it's up to him. So he became hated if he was greedy, and basically he could, he's gonna give Rome their dollar. Here's the amazing thing to me. Jesus calls uh, Andrew and Peter and who are kind of, they're enemies of Matthew. And then he goes and calls Matthew. So all of them have to render this. Can I work with that guy? Can I be in the same room with him? Everybody else hates him. We talk about race division, and we talk about all kinds of a division in America. We know what America needs, it needs a good dose of Christianity. There is no black or white. There is no rich or poor. We've divided ourselves down the line since day one. When somebody, when you, if you have a little money, and you think you're better than someone else, you are not a Christian. I'm going to tell you that. You think you're better than someone else, or you, you're, you require more. We are 5% of the world's population. We consume 95% of the world's good. So the reason Jesus said to the rich young man, rich young ruler, sell all you have and give it to the poor is because his riches set him apart from people. And so you can have riches if it doesn't set you apart from people. Listen, God blessed you so you can be a blessing to someone else. That's the reason why he blessed you. I've been a pastor a long time. Pastors here, they, they uh, back this up. The biggest givers to my ministry or to the church were always people who had nothing. Maybe that's why they had nothing. <laughs> the ones that didn't give a lot were the people that had this image that they were so big. Now, that's not always the case, but 
predominantly that is the case. The more you give, what does the Bible say? The more you, the more you receive. receive. Yeah. You open up the blessings. This is the Sea of Galilee. The sea of, the, Israel's pitched like this. The Sea of Galilee here has fresh water, has multi, multitudes of fishes. The Jordan River trickles down, runs down all the way to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has nothing. The Sea of Galilee is fed from the snows of Hermon. So watch this. It's a principle, and you can see it in Scripture. If something takes in and gives out, it's fresh and has life. If something only takes in and never gives out, it's dead and has no life. It's a perfect illustration. Be a giver. It's okay. It's much better to give than receive because you're giving life. And so this whole area is something that tells me not just about Jesus' healings, which there's many miracles here, but his words are phenomenal. And they're unbelievable when it, when it talks about what's happening. It's forgiving sins. So this morning, tonight, today I want you to just bow your head for a moment. And let me just un uh, let me just unreligiousize you for such a word. We all know when we got saved. If you know the date or you know the time or the season that you got saved, raise your hand. If you don't know that time, then today's the time. Today's the time that, to give it all to you. Follow me. Jesus is saying to you, follow me. And so I'm here today in front of you in the same spot. And I'm saying, in the place of Jesus, which I am not Jesus, I'm saying, follow me. Follow me. Make that decision. But for those of us who gave our heart to the Lord, it is quite okay for you to say, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Sometimes we get into Protestantism and we think, well, we ask for forgiveness when we got saved, and we never have to ask again. One of the things I miss about Catholicism is there was a penance that had to be done. You were constantly aware that you were not, you were not worthy of Christ's forgiveness. And so we're not, none of us. So, with your heads bowed, let me ask you a question. How many of you would say, I'm a sinner? Raise your hand. Notice that if you were looking, you would see there's pastors raising their hands as well as everyone else. We're all so today, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Before I pray for you, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and ask Jesus to forgive your sins and commit yourself to following him. And maybe you need to say it bit, uh, verbally. Lord, I want to follow you. I, now, he may, not, he may take you someplace. Be careful. Because he may take you play someplace that you didn't think you were going to go. Don't plan out your life as much as you possibly can. You can don't even leave room for God's plans. Yes, we have plans. Yes, we have desires. Yes, we have dreams. They're great. But we have to always leave a room for Jesus to step on our shoreline and say to us, follow me. I want you to do this. So let's pray. Father, I thank you today. I thank you, Lord God, for your people, for these people, Lord God, your children, Lord Jesus, who have already made a step to follow you, Lord. I don't want to go back like Peter. I don't want to retreat and say, oh, well, I followed him, but something didn't work out, and I'm not so sure I can do it again. I want to follow you every day of my life, Lord. I ask you to forgive me my sins, known and unknown, Lord God, my sins of commission, my sins, and my sins of omission, Lord God, the things I should have done that I haven't. I pray today, Lord God, for every one of us. I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord God. I pray that our humility would, would stay paramount in our lives. Lord, give us integrity, Lord God, that when people see us, they will see you. I'm thankful, Lord God, to be your child today. Bless everyone that is here. Bless their families, Lord God. Everything they touch, Lord, may it all give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> you have until a quarter of. Here's what I would ask you to do if you want to. Go in there, see that, see that, and remember what I told you, the scriptures I told you in Matthew. And just think about it in there, Jesus healing the man with the withered hand. And then down here, you want to go see on the lower part of you. You can go to that part. But on the lower part, it'll show you the different churches that were built and I'm going to try to find the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant over here. You can, if, so, if a priest says anything to you, there's a couple coverings we have here, and just be careful to take them. They may tell you to leave, so I would I would ask you to go over here first before you get down anywhere. Any other questions?